So we are in book six, the book of fate, and the second canto, the way of fate and the problem of pain. And this uh, canto starts with the complaint of Savitri's mother and the question on behalf of humanity, she voices the question, why, where has it come from, this mystery of pain and grief? And Narad, the sage from paradise, has been giving a reply all the way from the middle of page 442. He's been giving, answering her question from different points of view. And now, in this section which we'll read today, he, he winds up his answer. Very surprising answer that he gives to her. I'll read the whole passage and then we'll look at it in more detail. So I'm starting on page 454 at the break. O oh, mortal who complains of death and fate, accuse none of the harms thyself hast called. This troubled world thou hast chosen for thy home. Thou art thyself the author of thy pain. Once in the immortal boundlessness of self, in a vast of truth and consciousness and light, the soul looked out from its felicity. It felt the spirit's interminable bliss it knew itself deathless, timeless, spaceless, one. It saw the eternal lived in the infinite. Then, curious of a shadow thrown by truth, it strained towards some otherness of self. It was drawn to an unknown face peering through night. It sensed a negative infinity, a void supernal whose immense excess, imitating God and everlasting time, offered a ground for nature's adverse birth, and matter's rigid, hard unconsciousness, harboring the brilliance of a transient soul that lights up birth and death and ignorant life. A mind arose that stared at nothingness till figures formed of what could never be It housed the contrary of all that is. A naught appeared as being's huge sealed cause, 
its dumb support in a blank infinite, in whose abysm spirit must disappear. A darkened nature lived and held the seed of spirit hidden and feigning not to be. Eternal consciousness became a freak of an unsold, almighty, inconscient and breathed no more as spirit's native air. Bliss was an incident of a mortal hour, a stranger in the insentient universe. As one drawn by the grandeur of the void, the soul attracted, leaned to the abyss. It longed for the adventure of ignorance and the marvel and surprise of the unknown and the endless possibility that lurked in the womb of chaos and in nothing's gulf or looked from the unfathomed eyes of chance. It tired of its unchanging happiness. It turned away from immortality. It was drawn to hazard's call and danger's charm. It yearned to the pathos of grief, the drama of pain, perdition's peril, the wounded bear escape, the music of ruin and its glamour and crash, the savour of pity and the gamble of love and passion and the ambiguous face of fate. A world of hard endeavour and difficult toil, and battle on extinction's perilous verge, a clash of forces, a vast incertitude, the joy of creation out of nothingness, strange meetings on the roads of ignorance, and the companionship of half-known souls, or the solitary greatness and lonely force of a separate being conquering its world, called it from its too safe eternity. A huge descent began, a giant fall. For what the spirit sees creates a truth, and what the soul imagines is made a world. A thought that leaped from the timeless can become indicator of cosmic consequence and the itinerary of the gods, a cyclic movement in eternal time. Thus came, born from a blind tremendous choice, this great perplexed 
and discontented world, this haunt of ignorance, this home of pain. There are pitched desires tents, griefs headquarters, a vast disguise conceals the eternal's bliss. We'll start this side. O mm. mortal who complains of death and fate, accuse none of the harms thyself has to call. This troubled world thou hast chosen for thy own. Thou art thyself the author of thy pain. Mm. Hard words. Huh? He says, You have no right to complain about death, about fate. Don't accuse anybody else of the harms, the difficulties, the, the ill. You have called on yourself, you have chosen this troubled world for your home and you have caused, you are yourself the author, the author writes the book, no? we have ourselves written this book of pain that we suffer. Here again, um, Narad is speaking to Savitri's mother and he's using this second person singular. He's addressing it directly to her. He's not saying this uh, to you, to everybody. He says, thy, O oh mortal, you are a human being. You're complaining. She had complained a lot at the beginning. No? He says, don't, you have no right to accuse anybody. You have chosen this troubled world for your home and you have caught the suffering that you're experiencing, you have caused it yourself. And then he explains what he means. This is not the simple doctrine of karma, that everything bad that happens to you in this life is the result of something that you've done wrong in a previous life that you don't remember anything about. Sri Aurobindo doesn't accept that explanation. This is a subtler explanation which Narad is going to give now. Martin? Once in the immortal boundlessness of self, in the vast of truth and consciousness and light, the soul looked out from its felicity. It felt the spirit's interminable bliss. It knew itself deathless, timeless, spaceless, one. It saw the eternal, lived in the infinite. Mm -hmm. So this is where all our souls have begun. No? In the immortal boundlessness of self in that vast, infinite, eternal space of truth and consciousness and light. But he says the soul looked out from its felicity, from its happiness, from its bliss. It conceived of some other state. And when it conceived of that other state, when it looked out, then it felt the spirit's interminable bliss. Interminable, of course, means endless, but it means it in a special way. It means it in a negative sense. 
if something is interminable it goes on and on and on and on and you wish for it to stop you know? so it's a very subtle way he uses this and it's not only infinite eternal the soul begins to get a feeling that it's interminable and that there should be some other experience you know? it feels and knows that it is deathless, immortal, that it's not affected and limited in any way by time or space, that it is one, all is one soul in that vast origin. But it sees the eternal and it lives in the infinite already there's a beginning of a little separation hmm? you like to read? Yes. then curious of a shadow thrown by truth it strained towards some otherness of self it was drawn to an unknown face peering through night yes so it, it, the soul, it, it's the soul, is curious. It, it uh, thinks that maybe this light of truth throws a shadow. Hmm? And what might that shadow be like? It, it strains, it, it tries to imagine some other state, some otherness of self not that state of interminable bliss and that it's living in it is attracted it thinks oh there might be somebody else another face an unknown face hmm? that is looking at it perhaps through the night through the darkness the darkness of uh, what is unknown hmm? Leila. <laughs> it sends a negative infinity, a void supernal rules immense excess, imitating God and everlasting time, offer the ground for nature's adverse world, and matters rigid heart and consciousness, harboring the brilliance of a transient soul that lights up death and death and you know hmm. So it's attracted to this other possibility, this unknown face. And it senses a negative infinity, not this positive infinity that it's living in, a negative infinity. Uh, and a supernal, a an absolute void, an emptiness that would offer the possibility for nature to have an adverse birth not a divine birth but some other kind of birth that emptiness imitating God imitating everlasting time you know, offers a ground, a the basis for an adverse birth and for something like matter this rigid, hard unconsciousness which, in which a soul might inhabit but a transient soul a soul that's not immortal, that is pass passing some so, a soul that has some light, the brilliance of consciousness perhaps that lights up this whole process of adverse birth of birth and death and ignorant life some kind of imagination or idea or conception like that of that possibility or of that impossibility um, must have arisen. Hmm? Joel. 
a mind arose that stared at nothingness, till figures formed of what could never be. It housed the contrary of all that is. Mm. So he says a mind with a capital M. So a, a, a universal mind, a cosmic mind. And of course mind is something that separates, that um, delimits and analyzes. Um, I remember Professor Aurobindo Basu telling us once that in much of Sri Aurobindo's writings, mind and maya can be interchangeable. So it's something like that, a, a mind that imagines it's staring at nothingness, at this emptiness, and seeing forms and figures that are really impossible, they can't exist, but it creates a house, a space, where the opposite of everything that really exists can form or can be seen. Or at least it's, uh, it's happening as a result of that interest, that attraction, this consciousness is emerging. And that consciousness seems, it's a mind, so it has some creative power. You'll read, please. Yeah. And not appear as being huge still, of course, its dumb supporting a grand infinite, in whose abysmal spirit must disappear, definitely naturally and power the seed of spirit hidden. Yes. So in that mind, this, uh, this imagination appears of a nothing that would be the, um, the huge sealed cause of being. Out of that nothingness, some kind of being could emerge. Nothingness as the, the, the support of being in a blank infinite that has no characteristics and qualities. This support is dumb. It has now no power of expression. And into that naught, into that nothingness, the abysm, the huge depth of that nothingness, spirit must disappear. What lives is a darkened nature. And in that darkened nature, this adverse birth, Hidden in it is the seed of spirit. Spirit has to be there somewhere. It's there as a tiny little seed, hidden, and it's pretending not to exist. To feign is to pretend. It's as if it doesn't exist. So this is some kind of creation which houses just the opposite of reality, of what, is re what really exists. Um, Gumsun. If only consciousness became a prey, or one and soul, soul that all might be conscious and breathe them happily. Breathe? Breathed, yes. No more as split native air. air. Police was an instant of a mortal hour. A stranger in the insentient universe. Hmm. So in this uh, contrary creation, 
eternal consciousness. We can say this is a, a description of our material universe. No? Here in our material universe, um, consciousness appears as something completely abnormal. There's all this vast, immeasurable, inconscient. No? How in it do conscious beings appear? No? It's like a freak, something abnormal no? in this universe which is an, uh, seems to have no soul. That seems to be all powerful but inconscient. And the characteristic of eternal consciousness is bliss, is ananda. But in this um, contrary universe, this adverse birth, bliss is no longer breathed naturally as the spirit's native air. It just happens sometimes to some human beings and that's a mortal hour, it passes quickly. You get a little touch of bliss and then it is gone. No? Bliss is a stranger in this universe which is insentient. It doesn't have the capacity to feel delight most of this universe. So this is a nothingness that howls the contrary of all that is. And the soul looks out from its eternal satchidananda, its state of eh, pure existence, infinite consciousness, power, force, bliss. And it looks out at this other possibility. Alice. Alice? As one drawn by the grandeur of the void, the soul attracted, lead to the abyss, in long for the adventure of ignorance, <laughs> and the marvel and surprise of the unknown, and the endless possibility that worked in the womb of chaos and in nothing's fault, or looked from the unfathomed eyes of chance. So this is a very, very poetic way of putting it. No? As if it's attracted by the grandeur, the impressiveness of that vast emptiness, the soul attracted leaned towards the abyss. The abyss is a deep, dark hole. Mm. And it longs for the adventure. The adventure of ignorance, of the unknown. There's a Vedantic teacher called Alan Watts who has written several books about Vedantic teaching and he explains it, he says if you are omnipotent and all blissful and eternal and infinite what do you want? and he, will, he said you will say press the surprise button surprise me so it's, uh, that seems to be the attraction, or it's one way for us to imagine the, tr the attraction of the unpredictable, the unknown, the unexpected, mm -hmm. the adventure of ignorance, the marvel and surprise of the unknown, the endless possibility that's hiding there in the gulf of chaos. There's no harmony, anything can happen. Huh? in that gulf of nothing, anything might emerge. Or maybe these, some possibilities are looking from the unfathomed eyes of chance, deep 
as if chance is offering you this deep regard in which all kinds of possibilities are offered, unimaginable possibilities, impossible impo uh, possibilities. Hmm? And we, not, we now know what is the result of that. That's, why we that's what we are experiencing it and that's our spur to, uh, to move out of it, to find a way so to emerge. But it shouldn't have all been in vain, no? It's not just a matter of escaping. Escape brings not the victory and the crown. If we entered into this adventure of ignorance with an idea and a purpose, then we should fulfill that idea and that purpose. And in fact, we will have to. I don't think we can escape. We will have to go through the whole thing until we have the fulfillment of the, the manyness, no? the, the one soul wishing to experience itself extended in time and space and individualized in millions of beings, sentient beings. No? But he doesn't say that here. That's not what Narad is saying. But I think that's what Shobindo tells us. Uh, Bhuvana. It tired of its unchanging happiness. It turned away from immortality. It was drawn to hazards called and dangerous charm. It turned to the pathos of grief, the drama of pain. Perdition's peril, the wounded bad escape, the music of ruin and its glamour and crash, the savour of pity and the gamble of love, and passion in the ambiguous face of fate. Mm. So, he makes it sound quite attractive, no? And in fact, human beings are still attracted by all these things. Even if you have a very peaceful, easy life, then you will enjoy to read stories or watch films or dramas that uh, show all these things. No, we are still attracted by all of this. So the soul turned away from its immortality. It's drawn to the call of hazard, of risk. Hmm? The charm of danger the pathos of grief. We may not like to feel grief ourselves, but uh, to sympathize with other people who are feeling grief. Hmm? The drama of pain. Peril, the terrible danger of actually perdition. Perdition is when your soul dies. It's not just, or when it's in hell. It's uh, not just uh, the death of the body. Perdition, something really goes wrong for the soul. Or just escaping, the wounded, bare escape. You escape by the skin of your teeth and you are wounded, but you've made it through. There's something thrilling about that. No? The music of ruin. And it's glamour and crash. Well, we see the terrible effects of this in the world if we see now the films from Syria and Iraq, what is going on there. But we know that children love to make a big crash, no? They will build up a tower and then it will be the greatest possible fun to push it over and they'll build it up again just so they can push it over again. So there's something in us which enjoys all that. Hmm? The savour, the taste of pity. Hmm? And the gamble of love. Loving, of course, in our world is always a gamble. Hmm? It's, uh, we don't know how it is going to work out. And passion, intense feeling. And not knowing what is going to happen. The ambiguous face of fate. 
feel something is destined, that we have a destiny, but we don't know how it is going to turn out. Its face is ambiguous, and the meaning is not clear. Very well. Mm. So this is all the possibilities that the, um, the soul sees. A world where things are difficult, demand effort, hard endeavor, difficult toil, battle even, battle with the possibility of extinction, with ceasing to exist. No? The clash of forces the incertitude, a vast incertitude. And then bringing out of all that some wonderful creation, the joy of creation out of nothingness. And then the possibility of strange meetings, meetings with something new and unknown on the roads of the ignorance and the possibility of companionship with souls that we only half know, we don't know them fully. Or there's the attraction also of having to face everything all alone, the solitary greatness and lonely force of a separate being conquering its world. This is a kind of uh, satisfaction that human beings can feel. Mm -hmm. So all these possibilities called the soul out of its too safe eternity. Once the thrill of danger, adventure, uh, unexpectedness, surprise. Suresh. Uh, you listen, we have giant, giant for, for what the street says. Great, great are good. And what the soul imagines is made a world. Mm. So? That soul was just, the, soul, the spirit was seeing this possibility that creates something. The fact that it sees it, creates it, makes it true. What the soul imagines becomes a world. And so this huge descent, this huge descent of the whole process of involution, of the soul leaving its oneness and in the descent creating all these planes of existence until it's completely involved, hidden in the inconscience of matter and it seems as if it no longer exists at all. That was the beginning of this huge descent, this giant fall. Dana Lakshmi. We have thought that leap from the timeless can become indicator of cosmic consequence and the itinerary. itinerary of the gods, a psychic movement in eternal time. Hmm. So let's try and understand this. The soul originally is timeless, beyond time. If there's a thought, an imagining that comes from that timeless realm, you know, it can become 
he says, a cyclic movement in eternal time. It can go on repeating itself. So the imagination of this impossible world, this world of contraries, hmm, could become something that goes on happening. It may have a beginning and an end, but if it's cyclic, then it will happen again and again and again. So that thought, powerful thought that leaps from the timeless can become a cyclic movement in eternal time. And then it will be an indicator of cosmic consequence. It will show the way in which things have to happen in the universe, cause and effect. No? It will point the way to cause and effect in the universe. And it will point the way to the itinerary. The itinerary is the, the map of the journey. If you go on a tour, you buy a ticket for a tour, they will tell you we start from here at this and this time and we'll travel to the Madurai and we'll stay there 10 hours and then we'll go on to somewhere else. That's your itinerary. It's the map of your journey. So that thought will be the indicator of the journey that has to be taken by the cosmic powers, the universal powers that we call the gods. So this is the way, thus came, born from a blind, tremendous choice, this great, perplexed and discontented world, this haunt of ignorance, this home of pain. There are pitched desires' tents, grief's headquarters, a vast disguise conceals the eternal's bliss. So there was apparently this blind choice in the timeless, a blind, tremendous choice that let's go for this adventure. And out of that, uh, what the soul imagines, that imagination of the soul, this world that we live in, this great perplexed, we don't understand things, no? It's impossible for us to really understand things. And especially when we have to decide to do something, it's very difficult because we can't, we don't have enough knowledge to really know what will be the consequences of our actions. And because we are small, separated beings, in this vast universe, we always feel something missing. We are always discontented. Well, there's always something more that we need. This blind, this uh, great perplexed and discontented world is a haunt of ignorance. Ignorance uh, is always here with us. No? This is where it, it lives. And this is the home of pain. This is where desire, this whole principle of desire, which some philosophies consider to be the reason for the existence of the universe. No? Yeah. But anyway, this craving, this wanting of something always. They have their, their tents pitched here and this is the headquarters of grief where there is desire there's bound to be grief. In this world, the eternal bliss and the eternal existence and consciousness is hidden, concealed in this vast disguise. And he implies you have participated, O oh mortal, you, you yourself, have, are the author of your pain. You've participated in this blind, tremendous choice. 
Uh, so now don't complain. Don't, don't blame anybody else. Especially don't blame God. <laughs> as she was doing. So how does all this apply to this particular case of Savitri and this uh, disaster that she is facing? Hmm? Asvapati, her father, is going to ask that question. Uh, we'll read about it next week. O oh, mortal who complainst of death and fate, accuse none of the harms thyself hast called. This troubled world thou hast chosen for thy home. Thou art thyself the author of thy pain. Once, in the immortal boundlessness of self, in a vast of truth and consciousness and light, the soul looked out from its felicity. It felt the spirit's interminable bliss. It knew itself deathless, timeless, spaceless, one. It saw the eternal, lived in the infinite. Then, curious of a shadow thrown by truth, it strained towards some otherness of self. It was drawn to an unknown face peering through night. It sensed a negative infinity, a void supernal whose immense excess, imitating God and everlasting time, offered a ground for nature's adverse birth and matter's rigid, hard unconsciousness, harboring the brilliance of a transient soul that lights up birth and death and ignorant life. A mind arose that stared at nothingness till figures formed of what could never be. It housed the contrary of all that is. A naught appeared as being's huge sealed core. Its dumb support in a blank infinite in whose abysm spirit must disappear. A darkened nature lived and held the seed of spirit hidden and feigning not to be. Eternal consciousness became a freak of an unsold, almighty, inconscient, and breathed no more as spirit's native air. Bliss was an incident of a mortal hour, a stranger in the insentient universe. As one drawn by the grandeur of the void, the soul, attracted, leaned to the abyss.
It longed for the adventure of ignorance and the marvel and surprise of the unknown and the endless possibility that lurked in the womb of chaos and in nothing's gulf or looked from the unfathomed eyes of chance. It tired of its unchanging happiness. It turned away from immortality. It was drawn to hazard's call and danger's charm. It yearned to the pathos of grief, the drama of pain, perdition's peril, the wounded bare escape, the music of ruin and its glamour and crash, the savour of pity and the gamble of love and passion and the ambiguous face of fate. A world of hard endeavour and difficult toil and battle on extinction's perilous verge, a clash of forces, a vast incertitude, the joy of creation out of nothingness, strange meetings on the roads of ignorance and the companionship of half-known souls, or the solitary greatness and lonely force of a separate being conquering its world, called it from its too safe eternity. A huge descent began, a giant fall. For what the spirit sees creates a truth, and what the soul imagines is made a world. A thought that leaped from the timeless can become indicator of cosmic consequence and the itinerary of the gods, a cyclic movement in eternal time. Thus came, born from a blind, tremendous choice, this great, perplexed and discontented world, this haunt of ignorance, this home of pain. There are pitched desires, tents, griefs, headquarters, a vast disguise conceals the eternal's bliss.